Hey guys, this is Patrick from STH. And today we're gonna to talk about what in the heck is a DPU or data processing unit? Now you may say, okay, in my server, I already have a central processing unit or a CPU. I have a graphics processing unit, which is a GPU. And then I have some other features like NICs and all kinds of other stuff. So what the heck do I need a data processing unit for? Aren't these accelerators that are in my system or processors in my system, aren't they already data processing units? And the answer to that question is yes, 100% they are, but thank goodness that the industry has finally started to coalesce around calling things DPUs instead of coming up with their own random names for the segment. In fact, this is one of the big reasons that we haven't done a piece on this already. Although we've covered a lot of the piece parts and a lot of the solutions in the space, we really haven't done a video like this explaining what it is because we really haven't been able to call it anything. So what a DPU is, is something that's really cool. The basic setup is that as networking speeds increase and disaggregation is increasing in the industry and in the data center, we need a processor that specifically handles the movement of data. You may have heard terms previously of things like smart NICs and smart NICs in a way were really like a prelude to this space. And some people still call their solutions smart NICs, but realistically, this is a new class of processor. Specifically, these processors usually run their own OS. They have very high speed, usually one or 200 gigabit per second interfaces in the current generation. They have their own memory. And then they also have PCIe root complexes to go interface with things such as GPUs, NVMe storage or the host server. On board, beyond just the processor cores, there are also usually accelerators to accelerate the packet processing and also crypto functions. There can be other functions as well, but those are just kind of some of the high level ones. So in terms of what a DPU is, it is right. I mean, we have storage, networking, processor cores and memory. So it's right to think of these as little mini systems but they're a little mini high performance system. So first let's get into some of the drivers before we get into some of the implementations. And we're gonna go over a couple of the implementations from some big companies in this space. But what I wanna do first was kind of set the stage on what problems are we even trying to solve as an industry with the DPU. But before I do that, this is something new for us, but we actually have t-shirts and a whole bunch of merch that you can find in the Teespring shop down below. So of course, go check that out because you support STH and also I guess YouTube and Teespring when you order one of those, but as people have been ordering them. So thanks a lot. And this is kind of our first generation shirt. Okay, so let's get into applications. The first one is kind of really the low hanging fruit, which is things like acceleration for packet processing, for crypto offload and all those kind of features where the idea was basically, hey, the high speed, especially the 100 gig and faster network interfaces have become too much and they put too much pressure on the host server. So we wanna offload those to dedicated hardware accelerator IP blocks. And we're gonna put those in the NIC because that tends to be where all the data is coming in and out of. And so that was the basic idea behind the smart NIC. But then over time, people realized, well, we could do a lot more with that. And a really good example of that is AWS has been doing this for years, but they actually have a smart NIC or DPU type solution that sits in their cloud servers. And the purpose of that is they can run all the AWS services for provisioning. They can also run things like the networking. They can also run the storage block. So you can present the adapter actually as both a NIC, but you can also present it as a storage medium. So you don't actually have to have in chassis storage. You can go out over the network to go get storage. And so there are a lot of things that if you think of a cloud provider like an AWS, you get in terms of manageability. And one of the big ones there is that by having a smart NIC that you can control as AWS, and if you are presenting it as just a normal NIC and storage to the host server, what you can actually do is do bare metal provisioning, super easy, because now you can give your entire server to a customer while you run your AWS stack on the smart NIC. And when a customer is done, you use your smart NIC and your stack in your smart NIC to go and reprovision the server and make sure everything's clear and secure. You can also do things like you can run secure endpoints and run a, your own security network protocol over the smart NIC. And so that makes things really easy because you don't have to implement it in each guest OS. So what we're seeing with VMware Project Monterey is the culmination of a few different projects. And VMware kind of is giving the high level version of this. But if you think about what VMware is really doing, first off, you have ESXi on ARM and that was announced years ago. And by putting it on ARM, the ARM enabled 
SmartNix can actually run the VMware ESXi hypervisor. And by VMware being able to get into the SmartNix and run on the SmartNix like a Linux OS, that's a big deal because now VMware can deliver its product portfolio on top of a SmartNIC instead of having to go to the entire x86 server. So for a VMware customer, that has the kind of AWS translatable functions into a VMware environment. And good examples of that is that VMware will enable provisioning of bare metal servers in their cloud based on the SmartNICs and running the VMware stack on the SmartNIC, which allows you to go and do bare metal provisioning. It effectively lets you, in that case, virtualize your bare metal server, which is kind of really cool. The other thing it allows you to do is virtualize things like vSAN. So VMware can actually run their vSAN stack on these smart NICs. They can use the onboard acceleration. They can use the NICs and even potentially even like the PCIe routes on these things to actually go and provide a vSAN solution, a vSAN endpoint that is presented to a host just as an NVMe solution. There's an enormous possibility there and potential there using Project Monterey for VMware clients because it allows you to get closer to a cloud provider operating model. And Although we've talked about, you know, the kind of network acceleration, we've also talked about the bare metal provisioning, but that kind of, that whole vSAN discussion gets us into storage. So it's a little secret that most of the industry is moving away from these big monolithic giant storage systems into a more distributed storage model. And really the faster like 25 gig networking and 100 gig networking plus NVMe, those have been big drivers of that transition. Also, it's how a lot of the scale out storage companies and a lot of the cloud providers are doing storage. So that's a very popular way to do storage these days. And with a DPU, you actually have a couple of features that are really important. So first, you can run the entire NVMe over fabric storage stack. You can also build accelerators in for that NVMe over fabric stack. But realistically, all the SmartNIC guys, even years ago, when they had much slower solutions and less performance solutions, all the SmartNIC guys were like, oh yeah, we can run an NVMe over fabric stack because it's a super lightweight stack and it'd be super easy to run on a SmartNIC, so no big deal. But now with the bigger, newer solutions, it's actually a lot easier to go run NVMe over fabric. And what that allows you to do is it allows you to go out to a distributed set of NVMe drives that could sit in other nodes and other physical chassis and put them through the network. And then your data is presented and your NVMe over fabric is all managed on that SmartNIC or DPU. And then you have a PCIe interface to a main server. And to your server, it just looks like it's an NVMe device, like you had a giant NVMe storage device sitting in your server. But realistically, what's happening is that SmartNIC is presenting itself as a NVMe device, but it's actually going out to the entire network and going and finding all the physical devices wherever they sit. So that's how you get to real disaggregation. And that's storage, but there's another use case. When NVIDIA first announces buying Mellanox, something that we published and was like one of the first obvious things that they were doing is that they were looking at how do we go put our GPUs directly onto the network? In fact, how do we get away from putting our GPUs onto an x86 server anyway? Because do we really even need that? And we're using GPUs here, but this really applies to other accelerators too, like high-end FPGAs or anything else that is a kind of higher wattage, higher value part. You may want to go put those directly on the network and not necessarily into an x86 server in the future. And the way that you do that is that you put it into one of these DPUs because they have PCIe and they can act as PCIe routes. So you can actually directly attach your storage. You could directly attach your FPGA, your GPU directly into one of these DPUs. And then you get the really cool ability to put these things on the network. And so each, if there's a DPU in each server, now that DPU can manage resources and it can say, okay, well, I know I have a GPU over here in this box and I have an NVMe storage component over here in this box. And so the server that I'm attached to, I need to deliver both the GPU, but I also need to deliver the NVMe storage. And that allows that DPU to really be the quarterback, the hub and go out and get all those resources and deliver them to a server. And so now my server may have a PCIe interface to one of these DPUs, but because of the DPU, I can have access to things that aren't just in that chassis. They could be sitting in my network and all over my data center. So I think we went into a whole bunch of use cases there, but realistically, the use cases for this type of processor are really cool. What I wanted to do was take a look at a couple of the solutions that are on the market right now and show you how people are architecting these solutions because that also informs you know, the way that we think about how these solutions can actually be applied to problems because, well, we actually need the DPUs to exist before we can deploy them, right? So the first one I wanted to talk about is the fungible DPU or the F1 DPU. And something that you're going to see on the fungible DPU is a fairly common setup. 
There's a total of 800 gigabits per second worth of networking interfaces on the Fungible F1 DPU. There's also a total of 64 PCIe Gen 3, Gen 4 lanes. And so there is a lot of PCIe and, and network IO that are available on this processor. The Fungible F1 DPU actually has the ability to interface to DDR4 as well as HBM memory. And so in terms of memory, there's some really high-end memory that you can put onto a Fungible DPU. Fungible is really doing something different than a lot of the industry. Most of the industry is coalesced around the idea of using ARM cores, but Fungible has said, nope, we're going to use MIPS because, well, a lot of the people that do this are networking people, so they kind of gravitate towards MIPS still. So if we up-level what's in this Fungible DPU, we basically have a set of CPU cores, we have networking interfaces, we have PCIe interfaces, memory interfaces, and then we have some security features built in like a hardware root of trust, which is going to be common in a lot of the other solutions as well. Now on the Mellanox side, we've already talked about Bluefield 2, and we've covered Bluefield 2 a couple times at STH. And the Bluefield 2 is a little bit different implementation, but it basically has the same set of components. First off, we have the Mellanox Connect X6 DX networking, which gives us 100 or 200 gigabit per second networking, and you can actually do InfiniBand or Ethernet on it. As part of that Connect X6 stack, you also have all the accelerators for doing things like NV Mover Fabric, you have crypto accelerators. The other feature that we get is we get CPU cores, and specifically we get ARM A72 cores. Now you may be thinking, hey, didn't NVIDIA just announced that they're looking to purchase ARM? Yes, they did. We're not gonna get into that, but here they basically have ARM cores in their DPU device. Along with those A72 cores, you also have accelerators for crypto and you have your hardware to trust and all of those kind of features in there. You also have DDR4 memory support. So there is a memory controller and memory on board. And the other big component is that we have PCIe Gen 4, and specifically we have a PCIe Gen 4 switch on board. And that's actually a really cool technology because that allows you to connect more PCIe devices into Bluefield 2 because you're using a switch without actually having to have the silicon space for the root itself. And by the way, like all of the other solutions in this space, these PCIe lanes can run both as a endpoint so if you think about a server going to the NIC or something like that, or an NVMe SSD, that's really an endpoint, but it can also be accessed as a root device, in which case the NVMe drive or GPU or whatever can go into the DPU and see the DPU as a host. So again, if we summarize what features the Bluefield 2 has, we have the network, we have the processor cores, we have a memory interface, we have PCIe, and we have a whole bunch of security features like the hardware root of trust and management. We're gonna get into Pensando. Now, Pensando is another one that was covered along with Bluefield 2 on the recent VMware Project Monterey launch. And the reason for that is actually kind of simple. Pensando is also like Bluefield 2 using ARM cores instead of the MIPS cores that we saw on Fungible. And since VMware has made their hypervisor work on ARM cores, that's the reason that we, I think at least, see Bluefield and Pensando NICs on the compatibility list with Project Monterey, and we don't see the Fungible DPU. Now, on Pensando side, they had an earlier generation product, which came out, I think, about two years ago, but now they're on a seven nanometer Elba product. And I want to talk a little bit about that. So Elba can have up to two ports of 200 gigabit per second Ethernet, and you can actually go down to lower speed as well. But you have that, plus you have behind it actually a whole packet processing engine, and you have a P4 programmable engine behind that. P4 is something that in the networking industry you're going to see. It's coming on a lot of switches and a lot of other areas in the networking space, so people understand how to program for it. Now, as you get packets in, you can actually dump data into the caches for the ARM cores that are on board. And so we do have an ARM core complex. We also have memory controllers for DDR4 and DDR5. On this solution, we also have 32, I think, PCIe Gen 4 lanes. And those 32 PCIe Gen 4 lanes can be split up into eight ports. So you can think of that like if I needed NVMe storage, I could put eight NVMe PCIe Gen 4x4 four four devices and connect them directly to this DPU and not even use a host computer, I could literally just put my NVMe devices onto this DPU and put them onto my network. So again, as has been a theme, we have high-speed networking, we have CPU cores, a memory interface, a PCIe complex that can be either a root or a host. We have security features like hardware root of trust and all those kind of features in here. And then that kind of gives us our basic DPU. So I would say that the market for the DPU is still really in this early stages. Now, some folks will say, well, it's already here. People are already deploying these things. So it's really a mature market because it's shipping. I would disagree. I think that this is still a market that's early. It's evolving. And the question is, are we going to, in five years, look at the DPU in the same reverence and put them on the same pedestal that we do a CPU, GPU, FPGA? 
Right now, the race is on to really get in there and do that. And we've talked about three solutions. There are other startups that are doing it, but there are also a lot of legacy players as well. For example, Intel has had smart NICs for years, and they use a lot of times things like their Ethernet IP combined with FPGAs, and they usually have ARM cores as well. Xilinx, for its part, has its FPGA-based solutions, but they've also gone out and bought a company like SolarFlare to be able to go and deliver a high-end smart NIC solution or DPU solution. And they have the same thing where they have the networking IP, they have the FPGAs for programmable logic, and then they also have CPU cores and ARM cores. So all these companies are really competing in this space. It's been hard because we've always been calling them smart NICs, but they're really much more than just interface cards. I mean, these are really their own little mini CPU and mini server complexes that sit on a PCIe card usually. I mean, if you have high-speed networking storage, memory controller, CPU cores, and some kind of security platform, I guess you really are your own little mini server just in a very small mic microcosm. So although these solutions tend to be smaller, they tend not to use anywhere near the power of a modern CPU or GPU, they also tend to move data really fast because they have the accelerators built in to go do hardware offloads for moving data around, whether that's network traffic, storage traffic, or anything else. And by offloading all that work to a smart NIC and a DPU now, what you get is the ability to offload that work from your CPU. And by offloading that work from your CPU, if you're a cloud provider, for example, you have more saleable units, which is basically available CPU resources to be able to sell and make money on. So these types of features actually make a ton of sense. Something I'm really happy about is the fact that NVIDIA finally decided that they're going to call their Bluefield 2 solution a data processing unit or DPU like fungible guys have been using because that allows us to start moving into actually being able to call this set of solutions something, which is something that we haven't really been able to do for a while. Previously, Mellanox was labeling there's the IPU. Pensando has some other data something architecture. I mean, DSA. I mean, it's like, it's, let's face it. That is just too confusing. Let's all get onto DPU and let's just do it. Anyway, if you've made it this far, why don't you subscribe to the STH YouTube channel? You can also check out the STH main site regularly because we have coverage of DPUs and our normal hands-on reviews of servers and components. And as always, thanks for watching and have an awesome day.